morning, and thank you for joining Caterpillar's Safety Culture World Webinar. The title is Start and Support a Culture of Zero. I am Abby Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services, and I will facilitate today's event. Before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is that the phone lines are muted, so please submit any questions or comments you may have for our presenters through the Q&A or the chat areas of WebEx. I will monitor those and share those at the end of the presentation for the final 10 to 15 minutes. And also, this event is being recorded. A link to the recording, including the slide presentation and the audio, will be posted to safety.cat.com later today. And as a webinar registrant, you will automatically receive a follow-up email with a link to the site and an invitation to complete a brief, uh, I'm sorry, a brief survey um, about this event. Please do take a few minutes to respond to that survey because your input really does help us improve these monthly events. And now I'm honored to introduce our presenters today. Mike Brodock is a senior safety consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. Mike has more than 21 years of experience in the fields of civil engineering, environmental health and safety, fleet management, and leadership development. Before joining Caterpillar, Mike was the vice president for support services at Knife River Corporation, where he also served as director of safety. Under his guidance, Knife River earned national recognition for transforming its safety culture with tools developed by Caterpillar Safety Services, and START is one of those tools. And our co-presenter today is Kurt Soroki, also a longtime facilitator of the START program. Kurt is the EHS manager for Wagner Equipment Company in Aurora, Colorado. He and his team have been leveraging START since 2008. He'll share with you today some best practice advice and some details about the Wagner safety journey. And without further ado, I'll pass this over to Mike and Kurt. Well, thanks, Abby. I appreciate uh, the intro there, and welcome, Kurt. And thanks, Kurt, for taking the time to join me for this webinar, as well as you know the folks that have uh, have joined us online here. And these webinars have been very successful in introducing uh, some of the things that uh, Caterpillar Safety Services does for the customers, as well as giving you insights uh, into into our products. So we got a lot to cover this morning. So we're going to jump right into it here. And uh, this is what we want to uh, expose you to uh, this morning, the uh, insights in effective safety management. And we're going to be covering uh, these bulleted items here in the presentations. Six criteria of safety excellence. We'll show that the six criteria are so important um, in changing a culture. We're also going to uh, visit on sticking points, why safety programs uh, struggle. And We've all seen this happen, that we all have good intentions, but at times there are roadblocks that are presented in front of us that, that uh, present a culture from changing for the better. And we're going to jump into the START program itself, the um, action planning portion of START, which is what we call the linchpin. We'll explain that exactly what that means. The components of the Caterpillar Safety Services START program, and then finish off with uh, two important areas, communicating expectations, and we'll explain to you accountability across all levels. Um, those of you that have uh, attended my other webinars, we know that um, I uh, show this quite often. I think it's a very valuable quote by Dr. Dan Peterson, who was a organizational change manager, probably recognized as one of the leaders in safety culture change the last 50 years. But he says that, uh, or said that government safety organizations continue to focus on the physical to improve safety. We know that things don't cause the majority of accidents bad behaviors. What's interesting about this quote, he came out with this quote in 1971. And uh, we know that things really haven't changed uh, since then. OSHA, MSHA, DOT, it's still on the physical versus uh, changing, changing culture on this. And we know that, um, you know, the compliance uh, regulations, we have to do those. Those are important. But, um, you know, Kurt, I might just ask you, you know, if we solely focus on compliance, why will focusing on compliance only take a company so far in improving the safety culture? Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. You know, when you're talking about compliance, dealing with regulations, um, yeah, you might be fix that bad core, make sure that bad cord's not there or that fire extinguisher hasn't been uh, used. But someone had to create those uh, situations, and that's where culture really comes into play. 
And by changing culture, not only are you just going to meet those regulations or those compliance issues, but you're going to get people to start taking action on their own to make sure, sure things are right. Okay. Excellent, Kurt. Yeah, there is definitely a step process in striving towards world class. The six criteria for safety, and here again is Dr. Dan Peterson as I introduced the quote uh, that he said, as well as these areas. And he said if a company will focus on these six areas, you begin to change the culture for the better. Of course, at the top, uh, top management is visibly committed. Number two, middle management is actively involved. Of course, middle managers, you uh, you have many, uh, many uh, you know, um, departments to manage. Is safety part of that venue that you're managing? Frontline supervision is performance focused. We know the key to any change is frontline supervision and is safety a component of that. The uh, the next bullet employees are actively participating in our continuous improvement events that we do. We work with frontline employees on on stop gap, on looking at weaknesses within the program and developing changes uh, to improve. The system is flexible to accommodate the culture. What motivates uh, a certain work group to work safe may not motivate another work group or, or age class. And um, of course, the last one there, safe, the safety system is positively perceived by the workforce. The workforce should not look at the safety program as a set of rules and regulations, but actually an important tool on getting them home uh, safe. And uh, Kurt, just uh, you know, with your experience in safety, explain a bit where you've seen success in top management shows visible commitment to improving safety. Well, when uh, we all know as what the boss wants to do, the underlings are going to do what he wants or she wants, and. Um, Little things make all the difference. It's not just spending the money for a program or for the, that new tool or that new uh, harness or whatever it might be, but it's something as small as that senior manager walking through the shop and he's got his safety glasses on. And those little things make all the difference in the world, and that's what helps start building that culture change. Absolutely. Thanks, Kurt. Good, good point on that. Yeah, the visible commitments, one thing for managers and leaders to send out an email or a newsletter, but... When there's boots in the ground, that's when uh, a culture begins to, to evolve. Um, what's unique about this morning, and, and the reason we've asked uh, Kurt not only his experience and his commitment to safety at, at Wagner, but this is a case study in uh, when Wagner started started uh, a using start back in 2007, and we're going to have uh, Kurt give us some insights on that. The uh, area I want to hit on is performance plateau sticking points. And again, like I said, we all have good intentions. We want to decrease accidents. We want our people to get home safe. But there are certain areas that prevent that, and we call this the performance sticking points. Uh, you know, what I've found in my years of safety and, and working throughout different companies and with different companies that uh, are customers, that safety sometimes is a slogan. It's, uh, you know, it's not a value. And what I mean by that is that some customers think, uh, you know, a poster on a, on a wall, on a hard hat is going to do it. But as far as culture, it has to be a value just with productivity, um, customer service, quality control, safety has to be part of that. And the key point here, number two, is lack of supervisor accountability for safety. You know, our supervisors are held accountable for getting the job done, getting the repairs out the door, customer service, but is safety part of that? The other bullet, a why some companies struggle, is lack of employee ownership. Programs are purchased off the shelf, given to employees, shoved down their throats and say, make this work, when the employees say, well, it, it really doesn't fit our culture, it doesn't fit our circumstances. What's unique is when a company begins to use employees in resolving issues and problems, that's when you get the ownership in it. Some companies, again, as Kurt and I talked, are just satisfied with compliance only. And uh, we know that that will only reduce accidents at a certain level. And, of course, we've seen the traditional statements here, and I hear this quite often when I go out and with uh, Caterpillar Safety Services as a consultant, and we'll hear, oh, Mike, we've always done it this way. And this last little quote here at the page, injuries are part of doing business. That's one of those, one of those ex excuses. And, you know, jumping back up to bullet number two, Kurt, you know, as far as, you know, why are supervisors so key in changing a culture to the positive? 
well, the supervisors can really, uh, you really have to get them to buy into the program because they're the ones that are most directly impacting the, uh, the line workers. And if they're inconsistent in their decision making or how they proceed uh, with the program, you start sending mixed messages out to the people, and then they're no, they don't know where um, where everything is supposed to be going. And at that point, they're confused, and then it becomes, well, it's just another flavor of the day, and I guess I'll just ignore it because he's not doing what we told we were doing, so I guess it's not that important anymore. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, with events that I, I teach on, and I always ask, you know, why are that same question, and Kurt did a great job responding to it, but, you know, it always comes up that, hey, as supervisors, we spend more time with our employees than they do with their family. And we know these people, and we set the bar of, of whether we're going to have a, a, a positive culture or we're just going to get the job done. And if we didn't have injuries, then that's fantastic. Um, we're kind of playing that luck card. Other other sticking points, other roadblocks that may uh, prevent, you know, a culture from uh, improving is that, um, you know, the management sticking points. Of course, we talk management says it's committed but not seen in the field. The accountability process, failure to measure or praise results. You know, customers will say, you know, hey, we want uh, zero incidents, but they give no tools on how they're going to achieve that through the year. Your know, resources are lacking. You know, some companies just solely focus on a, a solely a, a productivity culture, not really a safety side. And the goals are not clear. They don't have a proactive action plan, and that's one thing that's key to this START program is that through the training, we uh, we develop a pro proactive plan, a action plan that can be incorporated by supervisors and participants that go through the program. And, of course, management, other management sticking points, mistake, it's a failure to support, encourage subordinates to exercise the power to decide, putting empowering the people in the field that can make some of the changes there. So... Other sticking points, you know, with supervisors, again, as Kurt and I said, that they are key in changing. And, uh, of course, conduct, supervisor sets a poor example. Just as Kurt said, you know, somebody showing up in the field, a supervisor, a manager, and not putting the PPE on, not putting the, you know, seat belt and everything else, put the poor example. Unsafe action behaviors, they're overlooked. You know, they shift it to somebody else. Someone else's responsibility usually falls upon the safety department. And uh, we know that one person cannot be in numerous places at once, so how can we say the safety guy's responsibility for safety when it needs to be in the supervisor side? The, uh, the other portion here is the team goals and the spirit. You know, if we don't engage line workers, the employees, sometimes that team spirit, that team goal of getting things to zero accidents is not achieved. And, uh, of course, recognition for a job well done, that's low or non-existent, and that will affect the morale, tension, and security being rushed, lack of faith in the supervisor. Kurt, you know, we've, we've talked quite a bit on recognition. Why is positive recognition so important in changing a culture for the better? Well, everybody always likes an attaboy, but in the case of safety, the positive recognition is the ability of the employees not to get hurt, in, in my mind. And... Obviously, in start, uh, we talk about uh, some of the costs of injuries and those type of things. And just as an example here at Wagner, uh, I'm personally not one a lot into games and those type of things. I think it's everybody going home safe every day is is is, is the reckon is the good recognition. But our uh, second year into the program, we had such tremendous gains that I, uh, our recognition was we were able to go out and get the money. Uh, to be able to get AEDs and in some for every single location in our organization, so that was 30 locations. And some locations got three or four AEDs, and that's just a visible reminder of the the, the positive gains that we're making as an organization. And everybody wins on that. And uh, down the road, that AED may be the thing that saves someone's life. So that'll be a great recognition. Kind of a twofold there, yeah. The AED saving life, but also. You know, what a great example of employees, how Wagner's committed to their, their safety, and, of course, that's going to improve the morale and engagement by the employees. And the recognition is so key, and when I do our recognition training, I say, you know, daily recognition reinforces the behavior that you want. 
rather than waiting for the end of the month or end of the quarter, end of the year to recognize somebody. Once you see somebody doing a great job in safety, stepping forward, you know, uh, working on equipment that's tagged out and and blocked and everything, you go up to them, five, ten second conversation. Thank you for doing that. Anything else we can do you, for, you know, do for you and help you keep you safe? It's that face time that's so very, very important. So, I mentioned earlier about the start training program and and the change that we've seen, and we call it the action planning, the linchpin of change. And um, of course, the goals to start the program itself. Um, we'll get into the components, but my introduction when I do a start, as well as the other consultants at Caterpillar Safety Service. You know, we want to give you tools. And, uh, you know, there's tools within the program or the we come out or do it, do the training, or you decide to buy the program and do it yourself. They're great tools, and we just want to see change makers and looking at transforming or improving, you know, uh, a culture of accountability. And many of you on this line are on the, on the webinar because it's a continual journey. And this action plan contained within the start is exactly that. It's uh, it's the change. It's a written uh written document contained within the manual of START. And this is just a, 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 a shot of a page, page 43 through 46. What, uh, how we do the training is we go through certain concepts, deliver certain ideas, have group discussions, and then the consultants take um, 10, 15 minutes and they ask the participants, so, okay, how are you going to change out there? What things are you going to take back from the training that you can incorporate in the departments and with the people that you lead. You know, I've all, you know, we've all been through training sessions where, you know, go over concepts, but as far as an action plan or a game plan going out, a written plan, you know, sometimes that's where, that's where things fall, fall short on that. And Kurt, you know, you started this back in 2007. You know, how does Wagner track these type of action plans? Now, we have all sorts of different tools that we're using now um, to, to track not just the individual action plans, but uh, uh, for individuals, supervisors, for departments. And uh, we have things like weekly inspections, monthly inspections, annual inspections. We have uh, employee opinion surveys. Um, we're dealing with a lot of questions on safety. Uh, reviews have uh, a, a segment dealing with safety. Uh, we do monthly reports, uh, dashboards that go out letting uh, where each area is on their safety training. So there's numerous programs that we've put into place that just keep communicating to everybody what expectations are, what their goals are, and how we're doing and meeting those. Fantastic. And you know, I've worked with several customers or currently work with, with several customers that they have gone through the training or halfway through the training and they're saying, okay, we're taking these action plans from the, the start manual and we're going to incorporate that into our internal computer tracking system where those supervisors and leads will sit down with their managers and go over, you know, you've identified, you're going to set expectations for your crew in more engagement in a toolbox meeting, um, how are you going about that? So it creates that accountability, but this is a good starting point. You can tell from from Kurt's comment there that the action plan was the, was the base, and now they're tracking a, a lot of other components to it. But again, with this, you know, the participants attend the class and they write down their, their game plan going out, and that's the whole whole definition of accountability. If it keeps coming up, if someone keeps asking me about You've identified what you're, how you're going to change. How are you doing with that? And if it's a boss, you can guarantee we're probably going to focus on, on making sure that we're we're tracking forward with that. Okay. This next slide here introduces uh, Wagner, and you know, in 2007, how they began to um, realize that you know they needed some change. But Kurt, just a little insight on kind of the uh, you know the storyline of of when things began to change in 2007. Well, we kicked the program off, like it says on the slide here, about a Six Sigma team. Uh, it was directed from a couple of our sponsors were senior managers, and they realized that we're going to have to start doing something different. It's not that we were bad. It's just that our customer expectations were starting to change, and we knew we had to do something different. So we started evaluating different programs and saw that a couple of our other uh, cat dealers had used the START program and had some pretty good results from it. And 
we decided that was going to be the way for us to go, and that started our journey. Okay, great, good story. And you know, 2007, and and I had a similar similar experience when I was at Knife River. We had reached a plateau with our our incident rates, as well as our safety morale and our safety involvement. And I began checking around different programs on, on you know, above the compliance side. We we spent a couple of years low hanging fruit hazard correction compliance training at the corporation and I was looking for that next step and came across the the original start that was start uh, that was shot in the uh, last of the 90s and and we incorporated that at Knife River 2003 2004 about 700 or so supervisors went through the program and we had seen immediate engagement with our supervisors once accountability was defined and working on a bit of the soft skills, the supervisors engaging with the employees. It, is, it sure took a turnaround where I was at, and, and we'll dive a little bit further in the change that, that Kurt had seen, uh, seen at Wagner Equipment. All right, the, the components of the program itself, and again, we only have an hour. We're, we're approaching that bottom of the, of the first 30 minutes of the program, and, but I wanted to give you, uh, everyone online, a, a good overview of what START is. And, of course, that stands for Supervisor Training and Accountability and Recognition Techniques. Three-part uh, three part module uh, that, uh, you know, takes the guesswork out of management and accountability as well as conversations and engaging the employees. And, you know, uh, of course, with this lagging indicators, we know what that is, the incident rates, the total recorded incident rates, lost time, so on and so forth, dart rates. That uh, we have, you know, we have to track those. You know, we have to report those up to federal and local insurance companies, so on and so forth. What the Start program introduces, it's a different types of performance driver of engaging people in the process. You know, what we call a level one, level two, if we're compl uh, compliance only and incident rates and observations, those are all important, very, very important. Where Start introduces the accountability portion, that's a level three, where you, we're beginning to move up the you know, the, the ladder as far as accountability. So, you know, three, three modules, and it's broken down into these three areas. Module one is the, um, you know, the reasons for caring about safety. The moral ethical, and the program uh, spends a lot of time on, on this portion of it, our moral eth ethical reasons to care about safety. You know, we know people that we work with, we don't want anyone to, uh, to get injured on that, and we show the moral ethical side. We touch on the financial, and of course, with any company, you know, we want to be profitable. And the financial impact of accidents is an eye opener to some on just the impact that that accidents have on that. The legal issues we've seen in the newspaper, where uh, you know companies are being fined, people are being jailed for negligence. We touch lightly on that, and we begin to find exactly what a proactive safety culture is. But the big thing here in Mod 1, we focus a lot of time on the moral ethical side of why we are caring for our employees, what's important as employees to our company. Module 2, what makes an effective safety culture? And we get into setting clear expectations. You know, rather than just hoping for the best, playing luck, the luck card, we set clear expectations of things that we can control. We go into the training, the training and coaching side of things on visiting with our employees. The notice and investigate of, you know, catching people doing things right, the recognition side, correcting. And then module three, we get into the basic philosophical beliefs on accountability, the new type, uh, kind of accountability, which I'll share that with you, and demonstrating commitment to the safety culture. Just as Kurt said, that supervisors need to be that, demonstrate the commitment, PPE, and, and walking the talk, we get into that. And then also conversations, involvement, and engagement in the uh, the employees that the employees are actively participating in that process. Um, of course, with any good pro program, we identify the why, the what, and the how we go about things. And the key, of course, um, with uh, with start is understanding where you're at. You know, starting with a baseline, and the start program helps you out with that. But Here's a kind of a couple screenshots coming up, of uh, maybe a self, uh, safety culture where you've been or, or where you're at. And here's, uh, here's a few excuses that I've seen. I'm sure Kurt and others online have probably been exposed to. You know, uh, one person saying, hey, stuff just happens. That's why they're called accidents. 
and playing that luck card. Sometimes, you know, the odds catch up to you. And here's another one in the middle portion there. The safety director is a guy responsible. He holds the meetings, does the training, handles, handles the investigation. That old excuse, when I'm out analyzing companies, I'll, I'll ask people it's kind of a loaded question, but I'll just ask when I walk around the factory floor or out in the plant, and, um, you know, who's in charge of safety? And of course, the correct one is that I'm in charge of safety. You know, the, the frontline employee, it's my responsibility, but at times I hear customers say that, you know, safety guy. Hey, Joe, the safety guy, he's in charge of that. And the third block there is, you know, that's not our job. Our job is to manage people and uh, the pure productivity culture. So the the thing with the start training here, it, it's a video program. Um, and I know some people say, oh, my gosh, not a video plug and play and sit back and relax. It's very engaging. It's a five-part videos, and they go compare a corporation that has three divisions. Um, one division seems to be doing it right. The other two are struggling. And through the storyline, an analyst comes in, and she begins to analyze this corporation and focuses in on what we can do right and shows the CEO of you know, the one division doing it right, the other two that are struggling. And uh, in between the video, we go through some concepts on reinforcing for the participants exactly what works. Also, you know, in the video, these two divisions, and, you know, of course, the, the one doing it right is the construction side, and we list to the left there of the positive aspects of that division within the video story that are doing things right, as well as the right side of the manufacturing warehouse that are struggling. And uh, Kurt, you've, you've seen this slide before, and you know any other excuses that you have heard in your career of why companies began to struggle or excuses that are used? Uh, it really comes down to uh, with many uh, organizations, when they try kicking off some kind of safety program, it becomes flavor of the day. And uh, it just becomes such a, and they say, well, it'll disappear and the safety guy will just take things over again. Well, like in my case, uh, there's just two of us, and we got over 1,400 employees in 31 locations, and there is no way we can be everywhere. And that's where the ownership of the individuals of safety um, is everybody's job at that point, and that's where our logo came about is Safety Begins With Me because it's up to each and every individual in the organization. They're the safety person. I'm just here as a tool and a resource. And that's a good point. And I know that, you know, I've shared the story of even changing a safety person's title from from safety director, safety manager to safety resource manager. And a simple thing like that sends a message for the supervisors, the employees in the field that in fact, you know, the safety person is a resource for that person. And and I hear that a lot, and, you know, companies the size of Kurtz where there will be 1,400, 2,000 employees, and they'll have two to three safety professionals, safety resource managers on site, and I'll ask who's in charge of safety, and they'll, they'll say, oh, it's a safety manager. I said, holy cow, that's amazing. That guy can be in 1,400 places at once, which we know just doesn't work, and that's why it's so important to engage, uh, engage all employees. As I said you know, more impact on accidents than what, you know, person realizes. Of course, there's the financial impact of things, but there's also just putting more stress on people uh, when somebody gets hurt and has to, uh, you know, has to be away from the job site. And, Kurt, explain this, this uh, quote at the end of this slide here as far as um, your little quote there if somebody gets hurt in a small shop. Now, this is where it really comes about, where it starts hitting home for a lot of the managers and where they start understanding the program that um, this uh, start program, it's not another add-on to what I'm, it's not more work, it's not something else that I've got to do. It gets incorporated in our day-to-day -day operation. And this is where that quote uh, that I often use really starts hitting home with people just for the fact that, they say, well, I don't have time for this. Well, if you lose that person and you got those three guys out on the shop floor, everyone's got 50% more work, how are you going to meet those customer requirements? Isn't it better to take 
a little bit of training and get some understanding and start changing things where that guy's not going to get hurt, it's going to make your life a lot easier in the long run. And that really started hitting home with a lot of the people. Yeah, and this is a, such a great quote, and I've used this um, in our training on that and have asked people, you know, if somebody, somebody is hurt, who, who would you fill into a key position? And some of the customers are smaller customers that really don't have a, a good bench depth or haven't been able to develop a good bench depth on, like, operators and repair technicians and processing. And I say, well, if, you know, Joe goes down, who can backfill Joe? And they say, well, Bill could, but, you know, Bill doesn't have that much experience on a, on a loader operator and productivity might go down. The other risk here, of course, with someone gets hurt within a, a department, the other people that have to cover, they might be, you know, they might take shortcuts to get the job done. Because, you know, as Kurt said, you know, 50% more work for the other guy, person to do. The risk in that is that person might be taking some shortcuts, which, of course, we know that those type of behaviors, risky actions, shortcuts, you know, leads to the majority of, of accidents when people are not following the rules and, and not uh, doing it in a way that's, that's safe. So, um Part of our, our key prompt plan, and I mentioned that filling out the action plan is, is, is so important in the start training, and communicating expectations. And this slide here, you know, coming up, it's, you know, what we do at times, we say, you know, we want, nobody wants, you know, lost time accidents. Nobody wants, you know, no recordables. And, but what, how do we go about reducing that? Of just doing your best and, and hope you get lucky, of course. And these are results everyone wants. No one wants to see somebody get hurt and be out of work or, or along that line or heaven forbid any, any fatalities. What's key with the START program is we give examples and have the people work on the type of activities that supervisors, managers, leads can control. And that's the proactive side. And, of course, key with this is, you know, set expect, expectations around things that we can control. And we visit in our, our training sessions on, you know, simple things like the lockout, tag out, the wearing of proper PPE, so on and so forth. You know, that upper upper circle there, you can probably put some of the things that in your industry that you're exposed to that you, you could focus in on. And it's, of course, setting expectations, but it's also filling out that action plan within the presentation of things that you can take out and incorporate and Last week I was in a, at an event and, and somebody said, hey, this action plan is fantastic because uh, we wrapped up at a 2 o'clock hour and the guy said, hey, I can take this action plan right back out to the people I manage and begin to look at some of the weak areas that I've identified. And one of the weak areas was, you know, toolbox meeting. And he said, are my people really getting the most out of the toolbox meeting that I'm leading? Or is it just uh, come in? sign the sheet, check out, listen to somebody for five minutes, go out there, don't get hurt, or is it really a type of uh, quality type toolbox meeting? So that's what's so encouraging about the action plan and the START program itself is that people in the class, they go right back out there. But the whole thing here is, you know, the proactive side of things and those activities that we can control. You know, as a safety professional over the years, there was times in my career I thought, man, am I doing everything possible to prevent accidents? And I came across this little model quite a few years ago. During that time, I was I was really kind of questioning my career decision. But I, I thought if I'm giving my tools to the people that are managing people, the very best tools, and they're using them, that greatly reduces that chance of injury happening. It reduces that chance and that just playing the luck card down to point zero zero dot 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 everything that we can do to control. So this is a very very important uh, slide, very very important important tool. The other portion we get into in the start training is just two way conversations, and it comes up often about you know the lack of supervisor soft skills and soft skills meaning that you know we've been promoted up through the ranks because we've gotten the job done, but have companies we work for invested in our soft skills, how to communicate. And at times we think what we want to send a, in our mind, we want to speak a positive message, but at times it comes out just the opposite. For example, 
you know, suppose a supervisor addressing his crew says this will be a really big quarter. We've landed some huge contracts. That means there's a lot of work ahead of us. I'm glad you're you're on the team. Of course, this is a very positive thing, but what does it really speak to the crew? You know, are we going to do it safe? You know, if the supervisor had the soft skills training that we cover in the program, um, he might close out the, the, the comment like this, and I'm concerned that someone might think they need to compromise safety to keep up with demands. My expectation is that we won't do that. Each of us will continue to work safely, effectively, so on and so forth. And this, this has been key in the training of supervisors, saying, hey, this is good to know that how we communicate. You know, another task of a, of a leader or manager or supervisor addressing a crew before a, before a job they have to do, hey, remember this is a trick tricky task, so let's be careful out there. We've got each other's back, right? Well, that's good, but how about being a little bit specific? So let's take some time to think about how we'll do it safely before they end up with somebody hurt, what would we probably have done wrong, and, of course, the discussion continues defining the pre-task, uh, you know, uh, a, a pre-task uh, step to eliminate risks as, as far as possible. Kurt, this slide here, you probably have visited, you know, Wagner. I know they invest in some soft skills with their people. Um, anything rings a bell with as far as the time, how people want to say the right things, but they, it just doesn't come out their mouth. Now, the communication piece of the whole program becomes such a, a, a big part of the program. It's, it's a, not just for the supervisors to be able to communicate, but even for the hourly people to communicate with each other so that uh, I'm looking out for you and you're looking out for me and you're able to speak up about it and know that there's not going to be uh, any issues because just because I'm the new guy doesn't mean I don't have different experiences than the guy that's been doing it for ten, the job for 10 years. I may see things differently, and that's where the communications really come. The, the training and the communications make a big difference on being able to make things happen. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, Kurt. And, and in the training, we, we network on that. We break folks off into groups and say, you know, how is, how is the training? How is your communication? Is there, some, you know, is there areas to be improved upon, uh, improved upon? Because at times, the people that trained us probably didn't have the best communication skills to begin with. You know, uh, I know looking back at my career, it was get the job done. If you don't get hurt, hey, that's great, versus, you know, like this, this comment to the right, you know, let's, let's talk through it. Let's visit on it. Let's take an extra five minutes. is worth is worth that taking that five minutes versus somebody somebody getting uh, injured. So, and this next area is uh, accountability across all levels, and this is where the, it's key to the, the accountability and the start program. And rather than just focusing on the safety professional doing the job, this accountability across all levels gets interwoven with with each company and each organization. And everyone, everyone is engaged in the system, and they help build the system. Okay, that's that two-way communication that uh, that Kurt had mentioned. And of course, we go through a four-step uh, process to accountability. Define each person's role in the safety culture, not just one person, but whether it's a veteran worker that's been working 35 years, or that new person, or the new person that's transferred in. Each person's role is defined in a, in a safety culture, a world-class safety culture. In my position, what can I do? You know, what can I do to ensure uh, my 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 safety as well as the person I work with? And we have tools that we give on, you know, to speak up, listen up. Speaking up when we see, you know, an unsafe act, un unsafe condition, and doing it in a way that doesn't uh, alienate the, the conversation with the person you're, you're speaking to, as well as listen up, a soft skill there of if you're receiving input from somebody on a task that you're doing that may be unsafe, how do you... How do you do that on that? As well as through a conversation on, on processes that can be improved. Of course, train. You know, training is huge, and this is the, you know, one of the keys to the START program is we do a, an analysis on the current training program that a company is engaged in. You know, and is the training hitting home? Is it keeping people in the know of, of the risks out there? And, of course, nothing's worse than being assigned a job and not knowing how to do it. And, of course, the risk factor there of not knowing how to do a process or procedure greatly increases the chance of, of injury on that. Of course, measure. Check. That's the, the accountability portion. And, again, that's where the action plan in, in the manual 
is so key. Record it, and someone's going to ask, and someone's going to keep bringing it up. So, hey, I better be prepared to give an account. And we've done projects on on recognition and accountability, and we've asked managers, presidents to go out to the field and visit with the, the employees, the line employee on, hey, are things improving? Is the accountability, are you being asked to help improve the process? And that is so key on opening up communication. But if you measure something, you know, a supervisor has a measurement component of the program, guarantee that uh, they'll, they'll work on it. And, of course, the recognition portion, recognition on a daily basis reinforces the behavior that you want, and that is so key. So the new accountability is support from, a, from the top. It's accountability from the bottom, and it's a, it's a, it's a continuous 360-degree circle of everybody's involved in the support accountability. So this is accountability across all levels on that. We're nearing the, the end here and um, have a few more slides, but... Supervisor's role, and we get uh, we get into this in the in the training program, and you set clear expectations for safety, not just the safety person's responsibility anymore. You train and coach with regular safety conversations. Of course, safety conversations is getting out there and getting face to face with employees, and you know, as as managers and supervisors, will go out and and talk to people if something broke down, or production quotas are not being being made. But do we talk about safety? At that, do we talk about safety other than if somebody gets hurt or something, some an accident has happened? But is it is it part of the culture to visit? Say, is there ways to improve upon this? The notice and investigate again, two way conversations. You know, talk about incidents, talk about concerns, ways to improve. And at the previous slide, at supervisors, we support that new type of accountability of define and measure. Um, demonstrate, you know, you're setting an example. Who you are and how you act determines how workers perform. And what's key in the program is we reinforce that supervisors, managers, they're being watched. What do they do when they're in the field? Are they following the rules? Are they setting the example? And, of course, facilitate meaningful safety conversations on the positive side. And the bottom block there we can all, all kind of relate to, you know, so workers do what the supervisor wants. You want to you wanna please the boss on things. Okay. Um, this is a great slide here, Kurt, and I just, um, you know, would, would ha ask you to, um, you know, your process at Wagner, how did you, you know, expose the employees at your over 30 facilities when you rolled out the START? Well, initially, on our, uh, when we first rolled out START, our goal was to get all, um, all employees that were in some management or supervisory function to go through the uh, program which was a, a full eight-hour uh, class. And as we were having many of these classes throughout the organization, a, a number of managers started saying, you know, we really need to expand this. And so what we ended up doing was to really communicate it out to the whole organization. It wasn't just for managers, it's for everybody. So we developed what, what I coined Start Light, which was a four-hour uh, start program using a lot of the same tools but it became mandatory that all hourly people go through that program, including uh, part of our new higher uh, safety week program, so that people come into our organization know where safe where we stand on safety and that safety is a value, and where we were at and where we're uh, where we're going and where we want to uh, end up. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. Thirty. 30 facilities and some customers they uh, they'll have us in and and we'll train two 300 supervisors on this on this program. So um, here's another good one that you know Kurt put together this article and we've used uh, used these quotes. But a 60 percent reduction in the in that first year was that a was that a surprise Kurt that if that was such a reduction? Uh, not really because what we had benchmarked because it was a six uh, sigma program and. We, want, we knew where we were at and where we wanted to go, and we were able to benchmark against the success rates that uh, two of the other dealers had used the START program and what they gained, and we expected that we should be able to do the same thing, if not more, because we did tweak a few things. So, uh, it like anything, when you first get into any program, there's a lot of easy 
plums to pick, and that's what we were gaining at the beginning. A little tougher now, but we're still making gains year after year, and that's what uh, the journey of a culture is. It's, it's a journey. Absolutely, and this kind of ties into that. this next slide, the journey, relentless pursuit of excellence. And, uh, you know, when I'm out with customers, I say, hey, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. You'll have some, you know, some immediate gains, but, you know, it's, it's, it's continuous improvement, engaging, engage, engaging the employees, of constantly looking at weak areas. And I mentioned, you know, you need to establish a baseline of where you're at and what are the weak areas, where the, whether it's, you know, lack of recognition or other areas, toolbox meetings, so on and so forth. And there's a portion, those of you that, you know, will receive the kind of the sample pack from us. There's a, on page nine, there's a 12 question assessment that I break people off into groups of four and five and you score yourself, you know, a zero being low, a four being high. And there's questions in there about is my company a productivity uh, or, or safety valued with productivity, uh, you know, throughout. And as a group, you decide, you discuss it. And the 12 questions encompass recognition. They encompass supervisor accountability. They en encompass are the employees involved in that. And that's a great assessment to really analyze weaknesses within your company. And I tell people anything below a three, you have to come up and write down on the, on the flip chart uh, ways to improve. So it's a, it's a strategic planning session within itself, within the accountability training. But that page nine is very key on just seeing your weaknesses. But nothing's worse than, tr than kind of throwing, a, you know, a, putting on a blindfold and throwing a, a dart at a wall of programs, safety programs, and not having success. You have to find that. But again, the whole thing here, that it's a continual journey. So I guess wrapping up, you know, the start program, you know, the, the three portions of it, the three modules on accountability, safety conversation, training processes, as well as a video story on a corporation that has three divisions, two are struggling, one does it right. It's, uh, it's a great program. And from here, wrapping up, keeping it simple, you know, what Kurt and I have talked about is that take this back. Every, everyone is in charge of safety. And I always, I love this quote. I heard this back when I was in Peoria, from the top floor to the shop floor. That's a new type of accountability. Bullet two is pay attention to the how and what needs to get done. That safety river slide that I showed you, setting expectations and the action planning. You know, when supervisors, participants of the start, they write down what they're going to change out there. They're being proactive with it. Pay attention to how and what needs to get done and focus in on the activities that will produce a safe work environment rather than the results, you know, you hope to achieve. And Dr. Dan Peterson has a quote that, you know, why are you tracking things you don't intend to happen? You know, and he says it's like producing widget you don't intend to, to produce. You know, why are we solely relying on infinite rates and results that we, uh, we don't intend to happen? There's other things you can focus in on and put measurements. You know, quality of toolbox meetings, recognition, uh, management engagements, communication. And from that page nine, you can begin to show how to improve upon that. But uh, with that, that's the uh, the overview. And again, great program, great successes. And um, you know, myself before going to work for Caterpillar Safety Services, used the program, had great success there. And by Kurt's, um, you know, example and case study. And this has only been an hour. I'm sure we could go on for hours and hours of the successes that Kurt had and others as well. A lot of, you know, we have a good majority of the cat dealerships getting momentum on this and rolling this out, which is fantastic. But there's our overview. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator, Abby. Okay, thanks so much, Mike and Kurt, uh, for all that you shared. Before we get into the Q&A session here, I just want to call everyone's attention here to this special offer um, that we're extending to webinar participants today to receive 15% off the START product. So you can see there's a coupon code there, START15, that you would be prompted to enter uh, into the shopping cart online. And you can find that by visiting uh, safety.cat.com and going to our shopping cart and adding the start product there. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to send us an email there at safetyservices.cat.com and we can help you out with that. So I'm glad uh, Mike and Kurt you left 10 minutes here or so for some questions because a lot of them did roll in. 
so I'll just read those to you and you guys can uh, choose um, who to take it. So the first is, is the start training geared towards supervision only or do line employees and management receive the training as well? You know, that's, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, no, it's just not for supervisors. And, you know, some companies, they will, and the, the best model, of course, they'll put their executive staff through it first, and then they'll start with their supervisors and leads, and then they'll incorporate some of the line employees on it. And I always say absolutely include, include some of the, the hourly workers. If you have somebody that's a safety champion on your crew, that's an up-and-comer through the your company and has been recognized as, hey, this is, uh, you know, a, a, a person we want to invest in, they can attend that training as well. That's that's why the program is is so very, very uh, important on that, that it's it's not just specific towards supervisors, but you can put all employees through that. And, Kurt, I'm, you know, if you've uh, done your 30 facility, facilities at Wagner, I'm sure you've probably put a lot of the frontline employees through the training as well. Yeah, like I mentioned during the presentation, we developed what we called the Start Light program for our hourly people, and all of our new employees coming in get that four-hour class. So, um, yeah, we've covered it with everybody, and it's all about culture and changing the culture and building the right cu culture where safety becomes a value, and that's what the program does for us. Some of the uh, more successful start training sessions I've had is when we've had a company present president sit next to an, an hourly worker and you put them working on the 12-point assessment of the culture and, you know, of course, management will say, yeah, we're doing great here and an hourly employee will say, boy, not from where I'm standing when I'm out there in the field. So uh, if you want a kind of a quick momentum getter, you know, you can you can roll the hourly in, into the training as well, as well as executives and supervisors. Really good question. Okay, moving along, and this one uh, I believe is directed to Kurt, and Mike, you may be able to weigh in on this as well based on your previous experience um, actually using a start for Knife River, but how has your executive management been impacted by the training? Uh, the biggest change has been, like I've mentioned a few times, is safety is a value now. So safety is the same as any of the key things business decisions are made, so safety is done with uh, consideration on anything we do. And that's been where the senior management, ha where it's really become a key part of the organization uh, of our value, that safety is the value. So I uh, hope that answered the question on that one there, that obviously if it's a value, they're, they bought into it. Yeah, and... Um you know, what's ex interesting about taking executives through the training, there are things that uh, they may not have been exposed to, the cost of action. Of course, they'll know their their modification rate and work comp costs, but when you begin to get into certain things of the moral and ethical side of things and the impact that it has on family and friends, there's an eye-opener there, as well as communication for, you know, the, the executives of, of the importance of them getting out in the field and visiting, visiting with their, their employees, FaceTime on safety. Uh, what, a, <clears throat> what a huge, huge impact that will have on, on moving your safety culture forward and exposing executives to the importance of that. Okay, and the next question is, can the training be delivered over multiple days? Why does Caterpillar recommend the training take place over a single day? Yeah, and, and and what I mentioned, um, you know, the actual participants' book, if there that is loaded full of group discussions, individual discussions, or individual drills, and the whole program itself, if you were to do everything, it would probably be, easily be a two-day program. And one of our, our customers is actually doing that. They've asked us to take their supervisors through a, a, a two-day Um you know, for logistics, of course, we're always challenged with that, with logistics and people working. We usually keep it at one day, six to eight hours, and usually a group of no more than 25. I found that doing eight hours, six to eight, of course, a lot of our people that attend the, the meeting, they're used to being, you know, up, about, and around. And uh, that's kind of the sweet spot that I found, that six to eight hours and doing it in one day. 
and the the head count. Um, you know, if you get above 25, this is just my experience. Other people may have other opinions, but if you get above that 25 head count in this type of training where there's a lot of interaction, a lot of group activities and networking, sometimes people are less hesitant to speak up if you get go to larger larger groups. But you could do a two day training on this. Um, you know, I usually like to keep it keep it six to eight. And people have come up to me afterwards at the end of the training and said, hey, you know, that last couple of hours, it was like drinking from a fire hose. There's so much information here um, that we can take that. So, you know, it, it, it's very customizable. You could do each module maybe one day if you're doing it yourself, a module each day or a module each week. Customers have done that as well. It, it, it's a very flexible program. Okay, the next question, um, this is kind of a long one. About 3% of our employees make up 80% of lost time accidents over the last 10 years. Has Mike or Kurt had any experience dealing with those employees who seem to be the habitual lost time accidents? If so, from their experience, what is the best or most effective way to bring them into the safety culture a company is trying to establish? I was expecting some beach balls here, but that's kind of a fastball. Uh, Kurt, uh, you want to take that one and I can kind of follow in? Uh, it's kind of interesting because I've been doing some studies within our own uh, injury reports, and I'm kind of seeing some base, same type of numbers. And we're actually looking at a program right now to uh, address those individuals uh, with our executive group and uh, set some expectations. So I'm in the early stages of putting a program together like that. So that's about all I can add to that question. Yeah, and my experience in past companies that um, I've dealt with and been asked that question is that accountability, and if you have some habitual offenders, you sit them down and you go over the training process. Why are they taking the shortcuts? Do they fully understand, you know, the, the correct procedure to do it? And then you say, we're holding you accountable for this. If they don't want to change, are they really worth having them work for you? Where is the asset versus the liability? But again, looking at our four steps of accountability, you know, define, train, measure, and recognize. You define, you make sure the training's in place, and you hold them accountable. I was at a customer one time that the uh, president was walking around and he had kind of a problem employee that wasn't wearing PPE, and the president said to the employee, hey, you don't have to wear your PP. Don't worry about that hard hat. Don't worry about those safety glass, that vest, but you can't work here. And that's kind of that new type of accountability. So that's how I've approached those questions in the, in the past when I've had that. To give people chances, but where are they, you know, to a point, are they a liability or an asset to your company? Well, that's what's nice about the program. It helps set the foundation and gives you the tools and the training and identify the training that needs to be done for the individual. So you've given them every opportunity to do what needs to be done. And um, you find that some people just aren't right fit for your organization, and that's a perfect example that you just gave, Mike. Okay, next question. Where would process engineers or other positions that occasionally interact with employees fit into this process? You know, I think any employee, any leader, you know, even if they go out once a week and talk to employees, the you know, the key to this is just safety conversations. Yeah, they're out there talking about production and quality and, and processes, but remember to engage conversations about safety. And when you do that, it reinforces to the, the employees that, hey, safety is important. It's just they don't – they come out to talk to me about safety and ask for my input. In the past, they've, the only time they've come out is when somebody's gotten hurt or we've had a spill or something. But, uh, again, it's, it's – you know, that's the reason I, you know, open with safety as a slogan and not a value. When some companies struggle with their culture, part of the value of a company is that safety is integrated in production and quality and processes. Now, and the other thing about that uh, question there is when you're talking about culture, it's not just in the work environment that you're learning. Uh, it's what you actually do outside of work that becomes part of your culture. 
And if you look at a lot of the new statistics that are out there today, there's a whole heck of a lot more people getting hurt at home or outside of work than they are at work. So the, the, the tools and the skills that you develop not only at work for this program will carry over into your daily life. That's a great point, Kurt. And, and one of the, the drills I have, I break people into groups of four, four and five, and I said, okay, what's important to you as an employee? And, you know, you, they start off, they're a little stumbling a bit, they'll say safety, and then pretty soon they get into family, and they get into getting home safe each night, and it comes up about safety at, at home. You know, they say, how important, if we're eight, ten hours at work and we're working safe, but as soon as we, you know, hop in our vehicle, you know, start down the road, is that seat belt on? When I walk through that door and I'm going out in the wood shop or, you know, uh, with tools or whatever, lawnmower, am I, you know, wearing your proper shoes, the eyeglasses? And I said, hey, that's that's important because the, the company needs you back the next day. So that safety emphasis 24-7, and that's actually have been a, a continuous improvement project we've worked on with work with customers is that safety at home and incorporating that. And, boy, you talk about a safety culture when, you know, mom or dad or brother or sister, boyfriend comes, girlfriend comes to the door, and they portray the safety emphasis at, at home. You know, that, that is so encouraging in a positive culture. Okay. Uh, how do you address the supervisor that views safety as an inconvenience? Uh, since Kurt took that one on the you know the three percent, I'll I'll start this one out, and Kurt can add into it. Again, you know here's the accountability process, and where top management has has to say to that that supervisor, you know you need to get on board. You know just as I've you know given you productivity, responsibility, and 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 quality safety has to be a, a component of that. And sometimes it's a heart-to-heart -heart talk with those type of from the top leaders to the supervisors and lead on that. And um, that's probably the best advice I can give on that question. Yeah. The one thing I can add that one thing that we did a little bit differently was that, um, yeah, we definitely had some of those, I want to call them old school supervisors that want to get it done, get it in, get it done, get it out, and no regard to safety. And... Uh, one of the things that we did incorporate into our program here is that there is a, a line listing accountabilities to, through the bottom line of the cost of injuries. So instead of it going into a corporate bucket, it gets charged directly back to that shop. And some of those old school managers, if I want to call them that, that manage the bottom line, found out real quickly what it's really costing them. And that bought, brought a lot of them on board real quickly. And like I mentioned earlier about some of the hourly employees, uh, some supervisors just might not be the right fit for the organization, and they may need to go on and look for a job elsewhere. Yeah, and I um, have had good conversations within the START training with the participants during class, and, and I always bring up, you know, how do you want to be remembered? Were you the leader, the supervisor, the foreman that, yeah, you got the work done, but you kept your people safe, or do you want to be remembered as, as that the supervisor that, yeah, got the work done and, you know, you had bodies along the along your your career journey. How do you want to be remembered? And some people get that. Other people, like Kurt says, you got to hit hit them in the pocketbook, and that's always a tough one to take that approach. You know, but if you explain the moral ethical side of things, and this is how we operate in in the new type of safety accountability company, we're going to hold you accountable for safety and safety for your your people. Some people get it. You know, the old guard sometimes they don't. And, again, liability versus asset. Okay. Uh, we're a little over time here, so I'm going to ask one more question of you two, but I also want to encourage anyone, any of our participants who submitted a question today that didn't make it through the Q&A session um, to uh, reach out to us via email, and we'd be happy to follow up with you and, and answer your questions. Okay. So the final question, Mike and Curtis, do you think – Smaller groups in training have a benefit versus a group of, say, 25. You know, I've, I've done smaller groups, seven to eight. Um, last week in Wyoming, uh, we had five people in the start training. And, you know, there's a lot of interaction drills within the program, whether Caterpillar Safety Services is doing it or you decide to buy the, you know, the program itself and roll it out. There is a lot of group activities. And, 
that encourages a lot of interaction with, with, with even small groups and the networking and doing, like I said, the assessments and what's important to you as an employee and, and doing an assessment of your training program and your recognition. So I've seen, you know, and taught uh, smaller groups of five to six as well as the 20, 25 groups and have had uh, just as much success to it. Yeah, that's the nice thing about the program is um, actually you get benefits from some of the larger groups just because of all the interaction and discussions and you pull in different cross-functional areas of the organization. And it's amazing how some of the walls start get uh, start getting broken down between some of these different groups when you have larger groups. So uh, you, there's uh, pros and cons to both. The other nice thing about it is if, if you take advantage of using um, – some of the CAT safety facilitators that will help with the START program, if you choose to do that, they do a real good job of keeping people involved in, uh, in, the, in the discussions and pulling them in. All right. Well, thank you two very much, and I want to thank everybody who participated today, and especially those of you who submitted comments and questions. I want to remind you all that you can receive 15% off of START through an online purchase. Um, or feel free to send us an email if you have an inquiry about the program. I also want to remind you that our next Safety Culture World webinar will be Wednesday, October 23rd at the same time. That's 10 a.m. Central, so I hope you'll join us for that. And you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's webinar event um, and access to a PDF version of the slides and an invitation, of course, to that next webinar on October 23rd. So again, thanks so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you to our presenters, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye-bye. <laughs>